Hey, here we are. It's Cheeky About a Bomb. Cheeky About a Bomb. Yeah, we, we're, uh, Fred and I are all over the place over the last couple of days talking about things that are going on all over the state. Uh, affirmative defense conversation. We just, mm, pardon me, I got the hiccups a little bit there. We're chit chat about and talking about all the people that put in applications for a grow and what's going to happen. I hear that over 35 of the uh, big guys playing are billionaire type of depth of pocket. So the out-of-state money is coming to Ohio. The hundreds of people that put in an application, uh, I feel sorry for all of them. You know, because start with, for everybody in Ohio that has epilepsy, everybody in Ohio that has MS or a neurological problem or disease or meets the medical requirements for the state of Ohio, uh, we've got some stuff that we've just been kicking back and forth. And I've been all over the country with this. But uh, hemp oil is legal right now if it's under the .0325 of the federal government requirements. That's right. So you can ship it, transport it, buy it, use it, smell it, do whatever you want with it, vaporize it legally right now. And that's the medical and that's where the CBDs with the no psychedelic, the no THC, is being offered. And I've got people calling me up every day going, Alan, compassionate Alan, you know, you're a minister, for goodness sakes, please, what would you do if your husband, wife, or child was dying? So I can order right now out of Arizona and am ordering and receiving through the U.S. mail or through FedEx or whoever is delivering that day, uh, I can order in packages of what I need from, uh, I like the what they call gold standard, uh, we're talking about that, which is just 100% CBD, no THC, and has been refined down to a very, very high level medical extraction. I can order that right now. Uh, the problem is, is there's a hundred companies out there selling hemp oil, and uh, some of them have poisoned me. Uh, they were using industrial hemp oil. Uh, that they can buy in some countries, China, one of them, and uh, it's full of heavy metals, mercury and lead and other stuff, and is poison really for a human being. Um, and and another part of that is the extraction process, because the way they take it out and on industrial levels, they use very harsh chemicals to strip the CBD out of the plant. So you're talking about if you are consuming industrial hemp, you're consuming a great deal of chemicals as well. And there's a lot of fraud going on out there. I mean, I was just uh, online with Rick Simpson uh, in, in Macedonia, and uh, Rick is saying that uh, he has not endorsed anybody to use his name. Uh, it's still his name. He can't live in the United States. He was made a criminal by Canada for helping people that were dying. And Rick, especially, has been built around cancer. And if you listen to Rick and start with, he's going to tell you anybody selling uh, hemp oil or cannabis oil that claims it's Rick Simpson oil, uh, that isn't any official claim at all. It's more like a con man statement. Yeah. Now, he does write books and say things about it, and he tells you, you know, if you're a cancer patient, you want, according to Rick, CBD. You want THC in your CBDs. In fact, you want the THC more than the CBDs, so in his mind cancer. only what is illegal right now in most states, THC-infused cannabis is what he thinks is the answer. Now, he's got a book coming out. He gives the formulas, tells you how to extract it and everything else. But that's Rick Simpson. Now, that's just, I'm sorry, I like Rick. I think he's one of the legends in the business, but that's just one man's opinion. I just saw a study earlier this week where they tested it against the normal medical routines of a hospital and against uh, uh, cannabis that had THC and cannabis that did not have THC. And they were looking at seizures and uh, that side of it more than anything else. And that study came back saying, certainly this is better than what the hospitals have been using by far. It's curing 30% of the people. It's helping in another 30%. And only about 30% do they not seem to really have any tangible uh, results from it. But oh my gosh, if you're saying 60% of the people are affected by any medicine, you're an astronaut, you know. With no negative side effects, oh my gosh, you are in the ballpark. So, we you know, speaking of negative side effects, you told me a story yesterday, and I was 
really astounded by, and I've heard you say it time and again, how cannabis is safer than an aspirin. Yeah. And I never really understood the details of that until you said that you were asked to look up how many deaths a year come from aspirin overdose. Right. And, and it's over 100,000 a year. And how many deaths come from cannabis overdose in the history of man? I had a doctor do Zero. this to me in Colorado in 2015 at the High Times Cannabis Cup Convention. And this doctor was talking to me, and, and I had a group of other doctors with me from here in Ohio, uh, Dr. Gupta, certainly, and his uh, entourage were with me, and a couple really nice doctors out of Cleveland. And uh, this doctor started explaining it to me, and when he made the statement, it is less dangerous than an aspirin, I called him out and said, you're a liar. Uh, now, I, I'm still not 100% on board with this thing because I think some of it's a red herring. But you're going to tell me that more people die from an aspirin than die from, from cannabis. And he started laughing at me. He said, I get that reaction all the time from you people in the backwards, hillbilly states, uh, Neanderthal hey, states, uh, Appalachian from the states. states. And uh, we do look like that to the people in the rest of the world that are enlightened, you know. Uh, we also look like we're perpetuators of the big lie. It's a level one drug with no known medical benefits. My God, the, our country's got to get rid of that lie. It's, it destroys our credibility in every country around the world, with even our own grade school and high school kids. It destroys our credibility as responsible adults. But uh, uh, when you get into it, uh, there's a lot of con games going on out there right now. Oh, but boy. This doctor front confronted me. I was a naysayer. I was a doubting Thomas. And he hit me right up where it counts and said, you got your smartphone on you. Google deaths by aspirin. And so I Googled it. And up came three or four or five different stories. And about 100,000 people a year that die of aspirin some horrible, horrible side effects, blindness and other things that can happen. And I read it and went, wow. But I guess if, for the hundreds of millions of people that use aspirin every day safely and it gets rid of their headaches and helps them heal and everything else, that, that's what we call a justifiable risk. And I get it. That's in anybody that's used a pharmaceutical extracted drug. As If you've read the side effects, they'll scare you to death just by themselves. <laughs> that's me, I mean, with medications on, I'm reading them going, oh my God, he's dying. Is I, he, I know, is I love that. Answer. They, they give you all these side effects, and then they end it with, and including death. And including death. Oh, I'll take that. And uh, so, <laughs> anyway, this doctor, to get, keep us on track a little bit, this doctor uh, said, now Google deaths by cannabis. And, and basically, for... 4,500 years, there hasn't been one death that they could attest came from using cannabis from the plant itself. Now, you can say, oh, well, the guy had five pounds in his backpack and got shot by a policeman. No, that's stupid laws that cause that and gun-happy, wrong-minded thinking. Uh, it certainly wasn't the plant that caused that. The plant is totally innocent in this case. This is like blaming the car for killing the person, not the driver, or blaming a knife for stabbing somebody, or blaming a fork for stabbing somebody. It's just ridiculous. It's a backwards way of thinking, uh, even though that's one of the main ways of thinking we still have back here in the backwoods of Ohio. A lot of country out here in Ohio. But, you know, I worry. Beautiful country. Beautiful country. I, I do worry about Ohio farmers and underground growers. I think there's about $3 billion annually grown in Ohio. This is a problem. Uh, well, not grown in Ohio. About two billion of it's grown in Ohio, and one billion of it is imported. I know at the end of May, almost every grower out of over three thousand, I believe I know here in Ohio, every grower I talked to was out of product. They said, "Man, that homegrown Ohio stuff just disappears so fast that before the new season can produce it, we will very often run out." And if you're a distributor out uh, there, underground uh, criminal, whatever you want to think of that person as. The farmer's uh, kids uh, that's putting food on the table. Uh, those people doing it are normally reaching out to medical people and people that enjoy it. But Ohio's strains of marijuana have been well recognized 
is some of the finest cannabis in the world. In the world. So we're a net import state. We import over a billion dollars of the product every year. And, uh, you know, by the way, if you take the underground growers in Ohio that are about $2 billion and you wipe out their crops, do they lose their farms, their tractors, their houses? Do they go back on the unemployment, Medicare rolls, and welfare rolls of Ohio? Are these hardworking, industrious people that are just trying to survive and feed their families in a horrible economic condition here in rural Ohio? And a lot of these families, you know, they know it's out there growing in their corn crop, and uh, it's just like any other crop, you know? I just was told an interesting story. Great story. Wasn't that a great story? Great story about a guy that uh, he had a trailer across from a big cornfield and he kind of noticed that they that's a really nice cornfield and what if I planted my plants between the corn rolls about every you know five or six plants I pulled a plant out and plucked in my uh, plant the farmer's going to water it and take care of it and it's going to be naturally there and all I got to do is harvest it at the end of the season hey this is a good deal so the young man took <laughs> off and did this and uh, over in Indiana was where the story was from at the time. Your home state. And my home state. And uh, one day when everything was ready for harvest, the young man walked out into the field and found exactly half of his crop was missing. And he was exactly half. Freaked out by it. Every other plant was gone. So he harvested it up what he had there really quick. Now he was a novice at this, brand new. He brought it home to his trailer across the street from the farmer's land. And uh, he starts trimming it and stuff, and then there comes this <laughs> at his door. And he, oh, my God, oh, my God, what am I going to do? i got all this marijuana here. What am I going to do? And he goes kind of to the door timidly and opens it up and looks out and sees Mr. Jones, the farmer. And he says, yeah. The mean farmer. The mean farmer is how he described him. And he invites Mr. Jones in, and Mr. Jones explains, we're in business together. <laughs> you are what's called a sharecropper. And by rights, 50% of that crop is mine. And uh, then he came in and sat down at the kitchen table, picked up a pair of scissors and said, look, you're not even trimming that stuff right. Let me show you how. <laughs> I love the story. But I think every farmer knows a similar story to that in the state of Ohio. Uh, did you know there's underground mines and caves and coal mines in Ohio? Great growth sites. Uh, there's all kinds of great growth sites. Barns all over the state, horse farms all over the state, uh, elaborate setups that you just can't imagine. You think, how can anybody finance or pay for that? And very often what you find, if you dig in very deep, is marijuana pay for it. Now, whether you are for or against marijuana, the obvious question is why hasn't Ohio been paying are collecting the tax for the last 20 years. I estimate about a billion dollars a year is failed to be collected for the last 20 plus years. And with a little compound interest on that, you're probably talking closer to 40 to 60 billion dollars. Enough that you could probably pay the health insurance for every person in the state of Ohio and got rid of the state income tax on top of it all. But uh, these are, uh, you know, and talking I'm like a financial I'm using man. Exaggerations in, in general generalizations here a little bit too, so you've got to take this little bit tongue-in-cheek. But clearly we've avoided collecting a ton of taxes. And those farmers who are a big voting block here in Ohio have um, managed to do it. And really, you know, families pull in next $100,000 a year, $150,000 a year that are out there in the cornfields of Ohio. I'm all for you. I, I think you're truly the pioneers of this day and age. And I'm 100% for you. I'd like to protect you in that process. Now, I, I really think that the entrepreneurs, ganjapreneurs, ganjapreneurs in Ohio should have been the first people that benefited from all this. No question. Yep.